Word of God. We continue with our series that we began uh, this past Tuesday. So what I want to encourage you to do is we are going to do, we are going to be doing a teaching and preaching series. So every Tuesday and Sunday will be on the same subject. We will be going through the book of Philippians uh, every Sunday and Tuesday. So if you're not with us on Tuesday, you may want to consider doing that or at least going back and watching the PowerPoint Tuesday broadcast. Uh, We broadcast it live on Facebook Live and YouTube Live uh, every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. We began the study on Philippians this past Tuesday with an introduction of Philippians, and we will continue the series. Uh, We continue the series with part two today. So if you're not with us on Tuesday, you may want to consider doing so. And if you're not uh, either, uh, if you don't like the Facebook page, you may want to consider subscribing to the YouTube channel, uh, uh, the Pastor Jeremiah Burton YouTube channel, so that uh, you can be able to view the broadcasts online as well. So we continue our series on Philippians with the theme of contagious joy contagious joy. And our scripture today will come from Philippians 1 and 6. Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and 6, may the Lord and a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word, and may he sanctify it in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for worship today. We thank you, Lord God, for bringing us together, Lord God, to worship you and to hear your your songs of praise, your songs of worship, and Father God, to be edified by your word today. And I ask, Lord God, that we uh, set all things to the side that we may focus on you, Father God. Let us sanctify ourselves for this time that we may be taught and edified by you in the name of Jesus. Father, open our hearts and our ears and our minds that we may receive what you have prepared for us. Father, I humble myself to nothing that you would be everything in me and that your word would go forth and perform that which you have purposed it to perform and that it would not return back void. Father, we bless you, we honor you, we glorify you, and we praise you. In Jesus' precious holy name, we say amen, amen, and amen. Philippians, the book of Philippians. We uh, began on Tuesday. talking about just more so introducing the setting of Philippians. We learned that Philippians, uh, the book, was written by the Apostle Paul. We also learned that uh, the church at Philippi was uh, founded by Paul, Silas, uh, Timothy, and Luke. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And so in learning that, we understand that uh, we also understood that Philippi, the church at Philippi, uh, was the first church in Europe. So it's Philippi then, it's modern day Greece today. Uh, and so uh, we, we found some artifacts there uh, that we were able to show on the screen of one of the mosaics that were built into the church floor that was inscribed with Paul's name that were excavated from the remains of that church. What we also know is that uh, Philippi being the the first Christian church in Europe in a Roman province, it was a thriving community in Rome in that Roman province and was a military post. So because it was a military post, it was a very uh, it was ripe with uh, Roman, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was ripe uh, with uh, Roman patriotism, right? It was ripe with Roman patriotism because it was a Roman military post. And so to introduce a Christian church in that community was uh, very risky, right? But Paul did it. And Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke did it, and they established it there. This book was written while Paul was in prison. 
He was in a Roman prison, right? But what's interesting about this is that the theme of Philippians seemed to be very positive. It says a lot about joy. One of the things we took away from this is on Tuesday is that's very Christocentric. In other words, there are 104 uh, verses in Philippians. There are 104 verses in Philippians. 51 of them mention Jesus Christ by name specifically. And, and so it, it, he was very focused, not on his, not just on his relationship with God, but also on his relationship with the people at Philippi, right? So it's a very uh, uh, relationship-oriented book. It is a very uh, Christocentric book, and it's very positive. We'll see how many times that the, the concept of joy and rejoicing is mentioned as we go throughout this series. Also, uh, one thing to take note with Philippians is unlike many of the other epistles, there is no real specific issue that Paul is trying to solve for or address, right? Uh, in, in the book of Galatians, he's addressing the fact that they, they started out okay, but so what, what they were very quickly deceived by people that were trying to convince them of the, the, the need to uh, continue on with the law and circumcision. Uh, the same applied to the, the, the Roman church, the same applied in the issue at the Corinthian church with their moral depravity that they brought in mixing uh, Gentile rituals in with uh, in with the the issues of uh, uh, Christianity, and so there was uh, there were a lot of issues that Paul addressed that were specific to those other churches. However, in uh, Philippians, he wasn't addressing a specific issue because the Philippian church seemed to be doing okay. They seemed to be following a good path and a good pattern, uh, and so. There was not a specific issue, but he was really uh, encouraging them to keep doing what they were doing with a message of joy and gratefulness for their generosity toward him. So if you missed Tuesday, that's the long and the short of it, right? That's, uh, that's the best I can do in the shortest period of time to let you know about uh, the, the background of the Philippian church. But what we see here is that Paul, we can see in the very first few verses, really shares kind of uh, uh, the Philippian church as a model church, right? When you compare it with what he was dealing with at Galatia, what he was dealing with at Corinth, what he was dealing with uh, at, at the church in Rome, he was, he was fighting a lot of serious battles and contending with a lot of serious things within the church, let alone without the church. Philipp, uh, the, the Philippian church really took a lot of weight off of his shoulders because they were consistent. Listen to what he says in verses three through five, in, in kind of describing them as somewhat of a model church. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is just happy and he's grateful for their consistency and for their support of him in the ministry. He says to them, every prayer of mine and making requests for you all with joy, meaning he is happy to pray for the Philippian church. He looks forward uh, to pray for the Philippian church. Well, Pastor, wouldn't anybody be happy to pray for someone? Well, sometimes there are prayers we don't want to pray, right? We pray Pray them because they're necessary. He wants to pray to get their child out of jail. That's not a prayer I want to pray, but it's a necessary prayer. Who wants to pray uh, that, that uh, somebody gets themselves out of a, a toxic situation or a time that we, we don't want them to be in that situation in the first place, but we pray it because that's the reality. Uh, in the same way, Paul probably didn't want to write these certain letters to the Corinthian church. He probably didn't want to write certain letters to the Galatian church, but they were necessary because they were issues he needed to address. In the case of the Philippian church, the, the theme here is very positive. So it sounds like he was looking forward to and happy about writing this letter and praying these prayers. And he's grateful for their consistency and their support in the ministry. And then we get to the, the, the text, which is verse six. And, and it, it says, being confident in this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so what we see here is Paul expressing confidence 
in what the, the Philippian church is doing, right? Uh, but not only that, he justifies that confidence. Paul isn't expressing blind confidence here. He starts to explain why he's confident that God will perfect this work. He says, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness. Is how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. So Paul is confident in what God is going to do in the Philippian church, but he's, he, is, he expresses the reason for that confidence, and that is because of what the Philippian church has done with what God began in them. God began a good work in them, and they have continued to take that work and engage in it. Right. He says that basically they have shown themselves supportive in his imprisonment. He says, you are with me in my bonds. In other words, they, they reached out to Paul. They, they, sent for, they sent gifts to Paul. They sent money to Paul. They wanted to make sure Paul was OK in prison. They looked out for Paul. Right. And, and so they joined him in his imprisonment in, in order to support him in that way. They show, they show themselves as partners in the gospel, right? Uh, he says a defense, the defense of the gospel in answering critics. Remember, this is the first church in Europe in a Roman province that was ripe with Roman patriotism. So you are bringing in a rebel religion, both on the Jewish side and the Roman side, into a Roman patriotic society. You are you have to be prepared to answer critics. And this church could have easily leaned on Paul to do all the work of answering these critics. But they partnered with Paul to be able to answer those critics. And the Bible says, Paul says, a confirmation of the gospel or a confirmation of the message to establish the message that is being preached from the Philippian church. They were a part of it, right? And so often when, some, when something starts, we lean solely on the leader to do all the work and we are the spectators. The Philippian church were partners with Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke in doing these things. So they didn't just lean on Paul and others to do all the work. They took it upon themselves to develop themselves as a community to defend and establish the gospel uh, within the church and in their community. And Paul was grateful for that because he could be confident in what they were doing when he wasn't there. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful that a leader can feel confident in their followers that they can be away and know that the work is continuing? And, and, and that is why he is joyous about praying for them. That's why he's happy about what they're doing. And that's why he's confident that God will perfect the work that he began because of what they are already doing. And if I could step into the margins real quick, I want to encourage us to do the same thing. God has begun a work in us. And the work here, let me remind you, we're talking about the context of Philippians in this time. So I'm not trying to, uh, while we can find some uh, modern application to this, I'm not talking about starting a business and I'm not starting to talking about uh, doing the modern day things in order to apply this. The work that Paul is talking about here is a defense and a confirmation of the gospel in an environment where the gospel was not welcome. And this is the work that Paul is specifically talking about. And in the same way, we need to remember that the great work is the presentation, defense, and confirmation of the gospel. That is the great work. There are many other works that we may be uh, inspired and called to do, but the great work that God has begun in us is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, now, there are many means by which we could, we could probably uh, present that work, and there, there are many uh, uh, means by by which we can uh, express it, maybe through music or through business or through entrepreneurship, but the work itself, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what he has begun. And that is what we are called to continue. And so in doing that, we need to maintain that consistency. It's not enough to start. 
We need to keep going and keep moving. It's not enough to say we've established this initiative, we've established this church, or we've got something started, and let's just let, let the pastor or the leader run with it the rest of the way. Everyone must be involved in maintaining the consistency of the work that God began in us. So real quickly, I want to go uh, over five things that will help us maintain that consistency. And this comes from Paul's very prayer. Because what I want to remind us of is this, is that Paul's confidence that God will complete the work that he started is because he is confident in what the Philippian church has involved themselves in as part of the work, right? He says in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so uh, before I close, I want to share with you five things that we can do to maintain consistency in the work that, Christ, that God began in us through until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, we have to be uh, participative in the work, right? The gospel isn't going to share itself, <laughs> amen? God will, accept, God will begin the work and we have to be partners in ministry and partners in the gospel, amen? So five things, five things, if you've got your pen, your pencil, your tablet, whatever you wanna use to take these notes, Five things to maintain consistency. And the first one is overflowing love. Paul says, this I pray that your love may abound still and more. Amen. Abound in love, overflowing love. We can't mention love without considering what Jesus tells us is the greatest commandment. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On um, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, we can't do anything else for God until we first love him and our fellow man. As a matter of fact, nothing that we say in the rest of this list can be done unless we love God with all of our faculties, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. We can't serve God and we can't serve our brother unless we love them supremely. So he prays that they have overflowing love. But then he goes on to say, uh, and more in knowledge. In other words, growing knowledge. Now, the, the, the Greek word here is epignosis, epignosis. Now, just a real quick uh, 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 Greek language lesson. Gnosis is the root word. Gnosis is the root word, and it means knowledge, right? Uh, but epi, epi is the prefix. Epignosis, in other words, is not just knowledge, but it is active involvement in acquiring knowledge. So it takes knowledge to a different level. It's not just having knowledge, but getting knowledge, right? It's not just knowing stuff, but knowing things in a substantive fashion and continuing to learn, active learning, active acquisition of knowledge. And so uh, he, he wants us to grow in knowledge and it highlights the relationship of the learning to the object of his or her knowledge. In other words, the focus on this knowledge is the person by which we want to know. And who is that person in this context? It is Jesus Christ. It is God. And it is the gospel that we must be actively learning. Uh, God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. And he, 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 there is, there is an, a limitless amount of knowledge in the scriptures that we can attain. Therefore, we need to be active in acquiring that knowledge of God himself and the gospel. Right? So if we love God and our brothers enough, then we will be active in learning more of God and of the gospel. And in doing so, the third thing that we can do to maintain consistency is by growing discernment, right? And that word is a thesis, right? In the Greek, a thesis, and that is a perception by both senses and intellect. 
In other words, sometimes we use discernment in a more emotional sense in that we have an instinct or an unction that just makes us feel like something isn't right. And while that's true, we must also add intellect to that, which means we can't have growing discernment unless we've already had growing knowledge because our knowledge gives us a framework by which to compare what we are discerning. Right. And so in this context, it means moral and ethical discernment in those matters. We are able to identify the difference between good and bad, right and wrong, right, because it is our growing knowledge that helps us be able to discern the difference when we are looking around things in this world and we have to make a decision of what is the right and wrong thing to do. It is that knowledge, that growing knowledge that gives us that growing discernment. So number one, we are loving God and supremely. Number two, we are actively growing in knowledge. Number three, we are growing in discernment. And when we have that growing discernment, then we have that discernment of excellence. Then we are able to filter out the good versus the bad, the right versus the wrong, the, the, the evil versus the good, right? We're able to filter those things out and approve of the things that matter, right? Focus on the things that matter. In church, there are so many things that are coming at us as Christians that we have to filter out and filter through and decide what matters because sometimes we can just caught up get caught up in so many semantics and we can get caught up in so many things that don't matter. Growing knowledge and growing discernment helps us filter out those things and focus on what matters. Set apart those things that are excellent, approve of those things which are more superior. And, and, and what I want to say to you about this is when we do this, we can uh, uh, do the great work, right? Not just the good work, but the great work. So we don't want to let good, you might have, you might hear this in motivational speeches, you might hear this in a corporate environment, you don't want to let good be the enemy of great, right? In other words, you don't want to settle for just enough. You don't want to settle for, you know, well, I've, we've got things going and established, so let's just uh, do what we've been doing and, and keep it at that. No, we've got to continue to grow, learn more, do more, establish more, acquire more knowledge and understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't settle for less than the excellence that God has placed in front of us from a moral, ethical, and spiritual standard. Amen. So number one, we are loving God and our brothers supremely. We are growing in knowledge. We are growing in discernment. We are growing in excellence. And when that happens, we are without offense. That fifth thing is holiness or being without offense. The Greek translation means blameless, not stumbling or falling. Right. So the five things that help us maintain consistency is an overflowing love for God and man growing in knowledge, growing in discernment, discernment of excellence, and being without offense. These things will help us continue to do the great work that God has begun. And when we follow this path or pattern, we will be able to continue the work through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God will be able to uh, perfect that work when we live it out in our lives, when we live it out in our actions, when we live it out in our devotion. Amen. And so the outcome of these things will allow us to be filled, as the scripture says, with the fruits of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And the purpose of that is for giving glory and praise to God. God has given us a great work to present, defend, and establish the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are, have to be active participants in that work through a life that is devoted to God and our fellow man. And so in order for us to be perfected in that work that God has begun, right? It's a work that he began generations ago that we must be active participants in continuing with it. And in doing so, we not only will establish ourselves as, a, as, as righteous, but we'll be able to present that to our brothers and sisters in Christ in a land that doesn't want it, in a society that doesn't care for it, right? In, 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 in an environment that is resistant of this gospel in an environment that is pushing away 
the, 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 the identity of Jesus Christ and the identity of moral rectitude and in an identity of, of, of ethical standards. We're living in a society that shuns the whole idea of moral right and wrong and looking for a reason to dethrone and discredit God. We are the ones that are in a community like Philippi that doesn't want us here but we have to continue the great work that God has begun in us. And if we do these five things, I'm confident, just as Paul is confident, that he will perfect us until the day of completion. And as we continue on, this is a book and this is a word of encouragement. Keep on with the work that Christ has begun in you. Because it is not a work that just started it is a work that continues and must be established until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The doors of the church are open at this time.